I wonder if we uh, sometimes sing those songs and really allow the words to speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Do we really mean that? I mean, would we be changed if that happened? Or we want you more than any. We're desperate. D E S P hyphen R A T E. Desperate for you. Are we? We're going to be talking today about King Saul and the anointing of God in his life. And I have to say, I'm a little bit. Um, I've got some trepidation about this message because I feel like it can easily just go right over our heads today. Um, I found it difficult to work through it because I'm not sure that that's where we are, that we understand how absolutely dependent and desperate upon the Lord we are. We'll see in Saul's life what happens when we move away from that. And I just pray today that every one of us will say, Lord, just here's a little opening in my life. I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn. And I want to invite you to pray with me right now because I feel like I just need the Lord to give me the exact words for this morning. Let's pray. Father, it's a privilege to bring your word. I thank you for the worship that was really so full of the language that I pray defines our heart. And I thank you for this church, Lord, that for many years has sought to walk in that, that very delicate balance of passionate worship and yet fully engaged in meeting the needs of people through the power of your gospel. And give me the words to speak and give these folks, Lord, the hearts to hear, and may we all leave just a change a little bit today, more passionately in love with you, in Jesus' name. Um, just last week, a week ago yesterday, I was down at the Consul Energy Center for the Festival of Hope. Anyone here get a chance to get down to any of those meetings? Some of you did? Great. Quite a few. On Saturday evening, I was at um, what was called the, the pre-event gathering where Franklin Graham came with some of his team to really express appreciation to the many people that had given literally, I mean, over the course of the last two and a half years, thousands of hours of volunteer time and thousands of dollars of money to pull off this event to reach people in our city. And as I don't know how it worked out this way, but I got in just a little bit late and just got shuffled around. And wouldn't you know, I sat down at the table and my table was where Franklin Graham was sitting with his wife, Jane, and several of his team. I didn't know why. I've learned when you get Plop down in a place like that where you don't belong and you don't know why you're there. Just be quiet. Don't, don't feel like you got something really important to say. Like, hey, you know, it's really cool that I'm with you because you want to hear what I know. Just sit there and listen. And um, it was interesting, very interesting. And Franklin Graham, as you know, or maybe, maybe you don't, is the son of Reverend Billy Graham, who was probably, without much dispute, the most widely known evangelist of our, of our generation, of the whole last century. And he actually, in his bio, he, he is called an evangelist. That's what Franklin Graham, that's what he, that's the, the title that he's given. But really, when he stood up to give thanks to the people and so on, it was a, it was a very warm and authentic kind of expression for maybe 10 minutes. He was going on about how the people came together and all it meant and what was going to happen. And then, just sort of unexpectedly, he shifted his conversation from the event to what had happened just a few weeks prior to that when he was involved in getting Dr. Kent Bramley and his nurse, Nancy Wrightball, released from Liberia where they had contracted the Ebola virus and brought them over to the United States. Do you remember the story? I mean, it was a national story in, in practically all the networks because 
These were the first two people ever to come into America with the Ebola virus. And when Franklin Graham started to talk about that, it was like he hit another gear. And he just started, he, you could see he just got energized and excited. And, and he, he started talking about what it took. And how many of you have ever been down to the DMV and waited in line and said, boy, you know, this, you know, it's just such a hassle to work through all this bureaucracy, right? Well, he got up there and he said, well, you know, we had to get the government, the state of, of uh, Liberia and the United States State Department, and we had to get the, the uh, CDC, and we had to get the World Health Organization, and we had to get the National Institute of Health, and he went down, and we had to get the, you know, we had to get this, and he listed eight different national or international organizations that all had a court, including, by the way, you know, Emory Hospital and everybody else, to say, yes, we're going to do this. Imagine doing it. How many of you would like that assignment to coordinate those people? Well, the way he said it, it was just like, and it was no problem. We just lined them up. And, and I sat there, and here's what happened. In just that heartbeat, I knew that Franklin Graham's real anointing and calling from God had to do with his leadership of Samaritan's Purse. That's really what he's about. That's his driving inner call. Samaritan's Purse, by the way, is something we've been involved in. Remember when we did the shoebox things for many Christmases and we'd send shoeboxes to people all around the world, children that needed things? We've been part of that organization. And Franklin Graham to me, and that just, I just saw right in front of me sort of a, an embodiment of what we're going to look at today. Because King Saul, and let's take your outline out of your notes, and it's all acknowledged that the babies are cute, but they're not really going to teach us much, okay? So let's, let's go ahead and get our outlines out and take a look at what the Word says today. Here we go. Because King Saul comes onto the stage as the first king of Israel. And the king that God didn't really want to put into place, but allowed to happen. But if he was going to be there, the Lord said, okay, let's be sure that he's anointed for the task. We're going to take a look at this together, and we're going to see exactly what it's about, because I found in doing this study that there's some very potentially serious issues that can arise that can cause us all to stumble. On your outline, look at the first introductory words there. It says this, um, and by the way, I want to, again, comment on one thing that I feel uh, I'm going to touch on things and bring up some topics that deserve a lot more in-depth exposition than I can give them. And, and I'm going to highlight those and maybe mention them to you. And when I do, I hope you'll go back and, and take a few moments and look at these on your own. Um, there's so much here, I just can't possibly cover it in 30 minutes or so. But let's take a look at this. Here's what initially Samuel, who was the prophet, and by the way, I should say this, this we've included Saul in the book and the, and the series rather on Judges because this takes place right around the same time that the book of Judges was written. Some believe that Samuel wrote the book of Judges. So Judges, Ruth, and 1st and 2nd Samuel took place all around 1000 B.C. So he fits in, and, and it's, it's, a, it's an appropriate place to, to connect near the end of this series, which we are going to wrap up next week. So let's look at this together. It says, all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, now look at this. You are old. It's just a little, um, for those of us that are, it helps if you don't say quite that <laughs> boldly. Um, and your sons do not follow your ways. I'm going to pause there and point out something very important. One of the real tragedies of life are people that give themselves to serving God, to advancing the kingdom, to building the church, 
and lose their families. And I'm grateful for my partnership with Carol and the support of this church that my kids have all grown up to love Jesus and to walk with him. And I just want to encourage all of you, don't ever let your kids be sacrificed under the banner of, well, I'm serving the Lord. It doesn't fly. And so the elders confront him and say, now we want a king like all the other nations. There's a good reason to have somebody, right? Everyone else is doing this. We want to do it. I don't even know when you hear that. It's probably a good time to say, back up a step and say, that's not necessarily right. Just because everyone else is doing it this way means that we ought to do it this way. No. But all the people, look at the next paragraph. All the people refused to listen to Samuel. We want a king over us. And then we would be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated before the Lord. And look at this. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. He didn't want to do it. But sometimes, you know, if you badger God enough, he'll let you have what you shouldn't have. Just so you can learn a lesson. He said, okay, let him have the king. So as I wrote here, the people wanted a king. And they moved from a theocracy where God was their king to a monarchy where a man became their king. And friends, no matter how difficult it may be to understand how God leads, it's far better to have God leading than to have a man in control. And that's what we're going to see very clearly here right out of the gate in the life of Samuel, or in the life of Saul, rather, as told by Samuel. Now, let me walk you through just three simple things that I think will be helpful little guideposts in terms of what all of us can learn from Saul's calling. Lessons that we can learn from his examples as well as his failures. Number one, on your outline, aspire to know your calling. Rick Warren, the pastor of Saddleback Church, said this. He said, there are five major questions that every Christian needs to answer, and one of them is this. What will be the contribution of my life to the world and to the kingdom of God when I'm done? How many of you think you can answer that question? Shall I say it again? What will be the contribution of my life to the world and the kingdom of God when I'm gone? You know, as much as I wish I could say, I bet 90% of us know that, I'll go way out on a limb and say at least 50% of us don't know that. And that's a shame. We ought to know. How many of you believe you're here for a purpose? Does it not make sense, and a lot of you put your hands up, that it, it should become a focal point of our lives to know, what am I here? What do you have for me, God? And how will the world be different because I'm here? You don't have to have some plaque on a wall or some monument to your name. You can write your legacy in the hearts of people. What will it be? From Saul, we discover that the way that God works is not always the way we expect. And here's the funny part about it. Saul was just one of a number of sons of his father, Kish. And Kish one day said, you know what? I've lost some donkeys, Saul, and I need you to go out and find them. Now, in the Middle East, walking around in the desert and the heat and so on, and it's dirty and dusty and it's not pleasant, looking for donkeys is not like a high-value assignment. You got that? So Saul goes out with his servant, and they're out for three days looking for donkeys. What are you doing, looking for donkeys? Seen any donkeys? No, no donkeys. 
And Saul's about had it, and he turns to his servant and says, you know, we better get back because my father's going to start worrying more about me than the donkeys. And that's when, now listen, this could happen to us. Out of nowhere, Samuel is prepared by God that on this particular day, a man is going to come in front of you who's going to be looking for donkeys. And when he comes, he's the one that I've chosen to be the king that the people have asked for. So the prophet Samuel is prepared for this. And lo and behold, up walks Saul looking for donkeys. And Samuel stops in his tracks. And let's just read. I mean, if it's worth, I think, reading the scripture. Here's what it says. See, the servant said to, he said to Saul, let's go up one more day and let's find this guy that's up in the hills here. He's a seer or a prophet. Maybe he can tell us some things. And so they go up there, and this is in Samuel 9, 19. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and said, would you please tell me where the seer's house is? And Samuel, verse 19, said, I am the seer. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you're to eat with me. And in the morning, listen to this, I will send you on your way and will tell you all that is in your heart. Oh, by the way, as for the donkeys, you lost three days ago. Do not worry about them. They've been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? In other words, the whole nation is going to come and bow at your feet. Saul, remember, he was just hunting for donkeys. Look at how he responds. He said, am I not a Benjamite, verse 21, from the smallest tribe of Israel? See, he he hasn't gotten the memo yet. And it's not my clan, the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin. Why would you say such a thing to me? That I would become the desire of the nation." But he obeys, and he goes up, and he spends the night with Saul. I'm sorry, with Samuel. And the next day, they head out. Something fascinating happens, and we're going to take a look at this together. Because, friends, we never know. We never know when God is about to take something very routine and suddenly change us in ways we couldn't have anticipated. One of the things that I I believe happens to many of us is that, and it was interesting, we prayed about this today prior to the the service, that it would not be a routine time. And you know, every one of us can go through a routine in life to where all we get to do is get up every morning and hope that we have enough strength to get through the day because it's the same old thing. And I'm here to say that God did not create you just to live in a routine where you just go through the motions the same way every single day. If that's the way you live in life, it's not the life that the Lord had chosen for you. It's not the best that he has for you. Every day should be a time when you wake up and say, Lord, show me today what you've got for me. How you're going to advance your purpose in my life. How you're going to help me understand my calling and move in it and make a difference in it. And you know what? It sometimes happens when you least expect it. I was, I went out to the pickup truck of the lawn service guy that cuts our grass at home. With my back and stuff, I just can't push the thing up and down the hill. And I said to him, you know, would, would you check up in the hill? There's some other things that need to be done. He said, sure, no problem. And I started walking back to the house. And he said, by the way, wait. He said, are you the pastor of that church up there with the big car crews? I'm always a little hesitant to answer that, like, you know, because I took my car there and somebody hit it with a hammer or something. Uh, and I said, well, yeah, I'm one of the pastors. I said, why do you ask? He said, because I used to go to that thing all the time. I love that. People, friendliest people that I've ever met. It was the best cruise. And I said, well, why aren't you coming out? We're still doing it. He said, well, and then without getting into any detail, he spent about 10 to 15 minutes telling me about a personal thing that happened in his life where he did not feel 
that he could hang out around a church because of this issue in his life. And I said, you know, friend, you're more than welcome at the car cruise, but can I tell you, our church has specific ministries every Monday night in our, that you would love. And, and, in fact, I'll meet you on a Monday night and go with you to one of these meetings. Just to, you see, I wasn't planning that. I, I had, you know, other things in my mind, but that was one of those moments that made that day special. Friend, every one of you should walk through your day and say, Lord, help me not miss those divine appointments. Routine moments become divine appointments when you're tuned in to what the Lord has for you. But in order for that to take place, number two, you need to acquire the anointing. Acquire the anointing for your calling. And this is where I want to just spend the bulk of the time quickly, but this is where I think most of us maybe need some encouragement. What is the anointing? Look in your outline. The anointing is the power of God in the person of God's spirit enabling you to fulfill God's purpose in your life. You got it? Purpose, power, I'm sorry, power, person, and purpose. That's what the anointing is. It's not some mysterious fog or mist that comes in and settles over your life, you know, like the Yesterday morning at 7 a.m. when you couldn't see more than a quarter of a mile. That's not the, the anointing is the power of God in the person of the Spirit helping you to fulfill the purpose of God in your life. Now here's what's important. You can try with all of your energy and all your creativity and all of your wonderful talents and gifts to do what God wants. But may I say to you, without the anointing, you are just going to be on a religious treadmill, working your way toward God and not getting any closer. The word anointing is not something we use very often around here, and to be candid, not very often in churches anywhere that I go. But let me use another word that you might be more familiar with. How about if I use the word certified? If you see a piece of meat and it's USDA certified, what does that tell you? That somebody checked this out and it's really good. Or if you're taking pilot's lessons, how many would like to take it from a certified instructor versus a guy who just, you know, has a plane that he flies once in a while, right? If you're going to have some plastic surgery done, what's the first thing that they tell you? Go to a board certified plastic surgeon. Don't just go to somebody who on the weekends does a little facial reconstruction stuff. No, we understand certification because that is sort of the that's the authentication that that person has been enabled to do what they're doing. That's what the anointing does. It certifies that you're prepared to do what God wants you to do. And friends, when that happens, you kind of know it. And I want to make this clear. It is not like some weird, mysterious thing. When someone comes up, and they do from time to time, they say, well, I'm just moving in my anointing. I usually move away from them because that... There's nothing weird about this. It is a very natural thing. Remember what I said about Franklin Graham? He just, he just found another gear. It was natural. It was real. It was actually compelling. But it wasn't weird. He didn't float off the platform. Anointing is the Holy Spirit working through you to accomplish God's purpose in you. And look what Samuel did for Saul. This is in 1 Samuel 9. <clears throat> At the end of the verse, I want to read this for you. Verse 26. So they rose about daybreak, and Samuel called to Saul on the roof and said, Get ready, and I will send you on your way. They went outside together. Verse 27. As they were going to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell your servant to go ahead of us, and the servant did so. But you stay here for a while so that I may give you a message from God. Now, how many of you would take that word, a message from God, and think that you're going to get to someone, he's going to tell you something? I would. Look at verse 10. Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil 
and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? And friends, that's the moment that Saul received the anointing to fulfill his calling. And I love the, the affection. It says that Samuel poured it over his head and kissed him. There was something very powerful that happened and transpired here. He became the first anointed king. Anointing happens then many more times throughout Scripture. David later is anointed by the same Samuel. But let's look at Jesus. I was stopped in my tracks by this. Our Savior is called Jesus Christ. And, you know, some people say, what was his name? First name Jesus, last name Christ? No. Jesus was his given name, and it would have been son of Joseph, but not Christ. You know what the word Christ means in Greek? It means the anointed one. Jesus, the anointed one. The anointing was so important that it was literally part of how we address our Savior. He even says it this way. Look on your outline in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me. There's the word. To preach the good news to the poor. Proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Recover your sight to the blind. Release the oppressed. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus ends by saying, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The early church was told not to go on until they received power. Let's put up first, I'm sorry, Acts 1, 4 through 8. Jesus said to the early church, this is after he's been raised from the dead, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So are you getting the picture, friends? Every time the Lord calls us to do something, he says, don't do it on your own strength. Don't do it on your own power. Let the Holy Spirit anoint you. And everything will flow much more smoothly and powerfully. When I first started in ministry, I was a youth pastor. They called them back. Now it's student ministry Extraordinary, yeah. So it, but I had, um, a, a, you know, typical mainline church youth group. It was really pretty, pretty good in a lot of ways. But at the end of my first summer, all the students had gone from a Sunday night meeting. All the volunteer staff had gone, and I went into the sanctuary of this of this church. It's here in our area. And I, I just kind of was discouraged. I felt like I'd done everything I could do for the previous 12 or 13 weeks and not much had happened. And I climbed up into what was sort of the choir loft area and looked out in the empty pews of a, a rather sizable sanctuary and I sat underneath this beautiful stained glass window by myself. And I just said, Lord, if this is what it's about, I don't have it. I need something more. And I waited on God and I prayed and I read different things in Scripture and I said, I'm missing something. And without going into too much personal detail, after about two hours of just sitting there and waiting, the Lord began to minister to me in a way I'd never experienced before. And I knew the love of God almost like a tangible experience, a moment that I'll never forget. And just as in Acts chapter 2, if we read on there, the early church, they had that anointing moment and they glorified God and praised Him in other tongues that they didn't know. That doesn't always happen, but it does often. That happened to me. I wasn't looking for that. And I got up from that time 
changed. Now, I didn't look different. I wasn't weird. Well, more weird than I was when I started. But I knew that I'd had an encounter with God. And I will tell you from that moment, and there are people that are in this church today that were part of that youth group then, that things began to happen that had never happened before. Because the Holy Spirit had a new place in my life. That's what he wants for all of us, friends. I'm not special. He wants for you to know that same anointing in your life, the same provision of God's power to fulfill God's personal destiny for you. I pray that every one of you will get stirred up enough just to start seeking this out. Start finding what the Bible says about your anointing. Can I be really honest for a moment? There are a number of us that are here today that identified with the story I just told, and that happened to you 20 years ago. But you haven't had much happen since then. You're living on yesterday's anointing. And I want to just submit to you that every day we should say, Lord, I'm available today for a fresh anointing of your spirit. How many of you know God doesn't just do this one time? This is something that we just every day should say, Lord, I, I'm not any more worthy today, but I want this. Holy Spirit, we're desperate. Do you know what I've discovered? The Lord has a very soft heart for people who are desperate for his presence. He will overlook failure, sin, rebellion, defiance even, if you come to him with a soft heart and say, Lord, I am sorry, I want to be all you want me to be. He just, he cannot resist confessed weakness. So, in conclusion, aspire to know your calling Seek to acquire your anointing. And finally, learn to admire those who finish strong. Let me just do this real quickly. Friends, there are a lot of people, a lot of young men and women right now. I can tell you at least five names right now under the age of 30 that have churches of 10,000 people. May I say, if you come across someone who's under 30 years old and they have 10,000 people in their church, you better pray for them. They are not ready for that. But with today's sort of the way, you know, social media works on, somebody can become really hot really fast and everybody crowds to see the latest thing. I'm not saying there's necessarily something wrong, but that is just not, it's just not how I see the Lord raising up men and women. It's usually a time of discipline and being under guidance and having a mentor and be submitted to discipline and, and to oversight. If we would read on here, we would see on our outlines that Saul began well. And by the way, in chapter 13, verse 1, it says that he ruled over the Israelites for 42 years. But then he squandered the anointing. And his heart moved away from God. We are not going to go and unpack that right now. We, it's It's sad. When you see how Saul became defensive. Do you remember that it became so bad that Samuel ended up anointing David, who then went into minister? And next week, if I have my weeks correct, we're going to talk specifically about that, that whole thing of spiritual authority and how David, even though he was appropriately anointed, would not violate Saul's position. He took it that seriously. He came to the place where God was so disappointed that he said to Samuel this. It's on your notes. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and not carried out my instructions. Friends, if I were to show you what Saul did, you'd say, well, that's not a big deal. But in the eyes of God, even delayed obedience is disobedience. And Saul, over time, just became distant from God and lost his anointing and then lost his kingship. 
We do well to have mentors and models and examples and people who are more mature to set our sights upon. We do well to do that. But let them be people that have experience. Let them be people that have been down the road a ways. Come up to some of our elders here after the service or maybe some people that you know here in the church, certainly our pastoral team, and say, what would you advise me to do? I want to grow in this, but I, I need someone to show me. That's the kind of people that will help you. And by the way, when I say finish well, I'm not just saying finish life well. I'm talking about finishing a season well, finishing a project well, finishing a commitment well. You know, there's a right way and a wrong way to leave a small group. Do you know what they are? Finish well. And when you do that, the Lord's blessing goes with you to the next assignment. I'll close with this. The name Saul carried through generations. And when we get to the New Testament, the man who wrote a third of the New Testament is out persecuting Christians, holding the garments of those who are slaying Christians when God, again, in a similar way that King Saul, stopped him in his tracks on the, on the road to Damascus. And he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I'm Jesus. And for three days he went and waited until another person came and laid hands on him and the scales fell off his eyes and he was anointed with the Spirit. And God changed his name in that moment from Saul to Paul. Saul, the baggage of disobedience and lost anointing. No, that's not appropriate. We want you to be Paul, the apostle, to the Gentiles. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you for the mystery of your ways. I thank you for the power of your gospel. I thank you, Lord, that you want us to aspire to know our calling, to acquire the anointing that you have for us. And then, Lord, to come and identify, to ad come under the oversight of those who can help us to finish strong. Thank you for the wonderful plan and purpose that your word spells out. And may we all be, Lord, a church where your spirit is welcome to fulfill your plans. In Jesus' name, amen.